Okay, so we got a question saying that they grew up in their family, grew up in a culture, and their extended family and friends often talk about their loved ones who are looking down on us from heaven. Is there scripture that supports that? And then another question, kind of blending these two together, of what what is the church and or like the book of Revelation show us of what heaven will actually be like? Are we going to be able to look down on earth and see our loved ones like back on earth? And or what is it actually going to be like? Welcome to this week's episode of The Follow Up, where we recap this week's sermon so you can grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus. I'm here with Pastor Jack and Pastor Jeff. Welcome, guys. Good afternoon. Hello. Yay. I'm excited for us to be here today. We've got a ton of questions yep. and most of them are submitted by the congregation. So first, I just want to give a huge shout out to the congregation for continually submitting your questions, setting them in. It helps us a lot in this and we love being able to answer them here on the show. Right. So to kick things off, the first question we have is how does the imagery of the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes deepen your understanding of Jesus's nature and authority? That's Jack's just looking at you. Uh, I guess I'll start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Roll with it. The, I mean, the horns represent strength and, you know, power and might. And so um, I think that we, I knew that about Jesus, but it's always good to be reminded of it and see it from a different, a different book of the Bible, explain it. The eyes talk about being all knowing and all seeing. And so it just represents, I think that the, even, the, even the, the number seven being a complete, yeah. you know, yeah. aspect of it is that Jesus is the completeness. He is, he is God. And so things I intellectually knew, I mean, maybe this is for a lot of us, intellectually know these things, but to read it again, and definitely when you're teaching it and you're wrestling with a pa wrestling with a passage, it just deepens it in general to feel, to feel like that Jesus is God and he actually deserves all of my worship and deserves my entire life. And so maybe uh, it's a reminder to me of that and it moves me towards towards worshiping more than I was before mm -hmm. because it's, this is a reminder. Yeah, I think I'd go a little bit on the front end and back end of those, the, the horns and eyes too, and that it was a lamb that, look like it had been slain. So you've got this the picture of a lamb that is, if it's been slain, it's either bloodied or it is beaten. I mean, we know what Christ went through. So, you know, if any of us saw a beaten and abused animal walk into a space, every one of our hearts would break. So we understand what he went through as God, because you're right. It gives us that picture of those God attributes. Yeah. And then you, so you got that bloody, beaten, abused, murdered lamb who now has these attributes and then is on the throne. It says he's in the center of the throne. So man, what a price to pay the power of who God is on display and, yes. and wisdom and power. And then on the throne. I, I yeah, to me, it, it's, it's kind of awe inspiring to, yeah. to realize what that whole journey looked like for him. A reminder for us that Jesus is, is God. Is God. He's yep. powerful. He's yep. all knowing. He has all the attributes of God, but he also is a lamb and was sacrificed for us mm -hmm. and took that upon us. And, that's the nature of the God we serve, which is just different than other gods yeah. and other um, people and other beings around. It's just, it makes them different. It's a contrast that's great to see within. Yep. Things. And it's a great bridge again, back to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole purpose yes. of the, yes. the lambs that were sacrificed for the sins of people. And after a while, it's like, oh, you know, you just get bored because how many lambs are going to be killed? And it's, they, they moved on. We read that in the Old Testament. Yeah. And yet here comes the ultimate sacrifice, you know, so that, that bridge is is in place. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So as we continue in, in the chapter of Revelation 5, which mm -hmm. we dove into this week, how does the scene of worship from this chapter, chapter inspire or challenge your personal or communal worship practices? Well, I guess for me, I think, I think it's good to see communal worship. And we see that in our parts of the, Bi of the Bible too. I, this personally for me, I've always, um, I guess I lean towards is like, private worship in a sense of like, I've had some of the best worship times in my car, wow. right? Yeah. Or just on my own and I'm just I'm, I'm listening to a worship song mm -hmm. or I'm praying and there's a worshipful time in that environment. There's also something something unique about being with, with a body of believers. And we see that on Sunday mornings here, but seeing it here has really been really cool to see this, just everything around them, the all of creation is worshiping. I love the public nature of it too. They didn't seem to be worried about what, who's seeing what, whatever it might be. And so I guess I look at my life as, I don't know if I'm really holding back because of what people are seeing, but right. I'm probably am in some regard without unknowingly, but I just want to be more public and be more open with not only my faith, my intellectual faith and my like way I live my life, but like my worship, my actual worship and being open about that. So people can see that this is the God I serve, no matter what you think about it. This is, this is God I'm serving. 
I love the aspect of kind of how it grows as John mm-hmm. spells it out. Yeah. So you've got the elders and you've got the creatures and then you've got the myriads, the tens of thousands, time tens of thousands. Yes. And then it goes to all creatures of the earth. So for me, there's a kind of like you said, there's this inclusive picture as, as the understanding of God grows and what this lamb has done grows. The expression I love for an expressive person, mm-hmm. I'm not too shy. Um, <laughs> the loudness, the volume, the lack mm-hmm. of fear, like you're saying, to just express it, mm-hmm. you know. And then as it grows, it says all creation. So your animals are. I, I joked a little bit on Sunday. You've got <laughs> mooing and chirping and barking, and then it talks about the animals of the sea. So I don't know what sound bass or trout make, but they're making it. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. all going forward. So the worship of God, and you hit on something as we were talking before recording, is like. We got our own sin. We've got our own life. We've got our own junk. And it's so easy to have all that kind of way into our worship. Mm -hmm. Whereas once we get a true focus of what's awe inspiring about Jesus, even if it's just in a moment, there's something in us that should be sparked. And remembering what Jesus did, that that slaughtered lamb, and yet he's all powerful, all knowing. So yeah, that picture for me, it just kind of of draws out of me a worship that I'm not watching my watch. Like I'm actually focused on what deserves worth-ship. Like sure. what of him has worth that should be worshiped. I love that. Okay. So discuss the role of the elders and living creatures in this chapter and how do they contribute to the unfolding narrative? Well, I think in general, I mean, <laughs> we, we know that, um, that God's using the, 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 the angels and the elders and living creatures to help shape this narrative. Okay. And so, um, I guess in essence, it's just kind of cool to think about that. Yeah. We're not as human beings, the only things or beings worshiping that there's other ones that are worshiping. I think it's one of the, the, the exciting things. And maybe just a, um, interesting thing about revelation, when you peer back the curtain, and you look into, you get peer into heaven, like there's things that we can't explain. There's things mm-hmm. that you're, and so when we, when, when we experience that, there's going to be beings we've never even seen before. Sure, and there's going to be point. experiences and situations that we can't even comprehend or think about. Yeah. So, um, and so I guess that's probably the, 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 the first we can go with it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, there's a char- there's a character in this story and this vision, mm-hmm. so we can't discount, discount them at all, but yeah. what, what the role they're playing and how that impacts me, I guess I don't really know, but. Jeff just gave a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, that's a good question. I, know. I didn't dive into that. I would, yeah, that's a good, that's, that's a good picture though. Yeah. Okay, we're moving on to questions that the congregation has yep. submitted. Yeah. So this one's specifically for you, Jack, that you had talked about how in Revelation 5, there was no one who was able to open the scroll, mm-hmm. including God. Mm-hmm. And they say, I thought I thought God could do anything. Yep. Can you explain further what you meant by that? Sure. Let me back up for a second, because there's the philosophical side of this. And then we try and put it in an earthly perspective. I had a friend one time, atheist, and he was like, well, God, can God make a rock too big for himself to carry or pick up? And it's like, you've, you're trying to put earthly attributes into a spiritual mm-hmm. heavenly God. So it's, it's not that it's not like God can't, like we try and think of can and can't, but you know, what happens if he does like God's unfiltered wrath without the lamb who, who we read about later stepping in and, and dealing with the wrath of God, when God opens that scroll and we're going to find out later in revelation, Mm -hmm. what that scroll is like, we're going to see the, the unfurling and the fulfilling of his purposes. If, there, if it's unfiltered, a, a just God having to deal with unjust people, we're toast. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's why who's worthy? Like who can step in the gap between God and man? Nobody. Like who's perfect enough to stand in for God? Who's human enough to stand in for man? Nobody until the lamb steps forward. And that's Jesus. So it's not can't like he's inept. Mm-hmm. It's can't like if he does, he's either got to fry us or he's got to sweep all sin under the rug. Mm-hmm. And he, a just God can't do that either. So it that's kind of the picture. It demonstrates God's love for us. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, God mm-hmm. loves us deeply that he does want to open that because he doesn't want that to happen. He wants right. this, mm-hmm. he wants this, this way, this sacrifice to be made so we can be in communion with him. So yep. I think it's out of his love that he's not opening that scroll. Yeah. So that he waits for Jesus to do it. Yeah. Love it. Okay, so we got a question saying that they grew up in, their family grew up in a culture and their extended family and friends often talk about their loved ones who are looking down on us from heaven. Is there scripture that supports that? And then another question kind of blending these two together of what, what is the church and 
or like the book of Revelation show us of what heaven will actually be like? Are we going to be able to look down on earth and see our loved ones like back on earth and or what is it actually going to be like? So what I would ask is maybe hit pause on the back end of that question, because I'd love for us to be able to dive more into that when we get into that part of Revelation. I think I think we'd be robbing a little bit from it or or jumping ahead and missing some important facts if we if we try and answer that now. But I'll also say this. I think we've got this picture of heaven once again of people sitting in diapers on clouds looking down, Mm -hmm. you know, while they're playing their harp. And it's a misnomer of what heaven is. You know, we we automatically think heaven up, you know, and we we miss the. we, we miss the bigger picture of what heaven is. So if we take the movie aspect out of heaven, like it's this bowl around the top, we do. He, Hebrews talks about the greater cloud of witnesses mm-hmm. who are watching. So there is an understanding we're going to read in Revelation later um, about the, those who are praying for those who are martyred and the per- persecuted church and persecuted saints. So there's an understanding. Um but it's it's not this bowl up above earth where people are peeking over the side, looking mm-hmm. down on us or sitting on a cloud, hoping they don't fall off as they as they watch. I think that's that's more movie aspect. And like I said, the rest of the aspects of heaven, let's I, I would ask, let, like, let's wait till we get to that part of the book. Mm-hmm. Well said, Jack. Yeah, <laughs> so stay tuned. That's all we have to say for there that. You go. OK, so we have a life group who is wondering the reason behind John weeping in verse four and they would love your thoughts. And then they also wanted to know which elder knew to say, do not weep. Mm-hmm. Sure. I think the elder was Bob, just a hunch. <laughs> I don't know. Right. It, it doesn't give us He's a name. Robert, but he goes by Robert. Robert. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think, I think we don't really know which elder or uh, we, we're not told that. And apparently is it, is it as important in, in the scripture for us, for him to share that? I think why he's weeping goes back to our discussion before. Mm-hmm is that I think, I think John really wants the redemption of the world. He wants, wants people to be saved. He wants this, this broken world to be made right again. And he knows, however he knows that, he knows that un, un, opening a scroll ha, has it happened. So when no one can open it, he's just grieving and weeping and sad that there's, there's no way towards redeeming the world, which he desperately, desperately wants. And so I, I, I guess I join him in that, you know, right. yeah. without the hope that Jesus brings into this world, uh, that's a sad reality to be living into. And so I guess we, I join him in that, in that regard. If I'm in that same spot, I'd be pretty sad too and be weeping as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, we're going to hit on this in a few weeks on what those scrolls contain because we see the scrolls now and it's kind of like a part of it in a movie when you get a clue, but you don't know what the clue is yet. Mm-hmm. The scrolls are a clue, but we don't get fully what the clue is yet. We're going to in a couple of weeks. And those scrolls, like, like you're saying, it's the fulfillment of what God has planned. Um, and there's also the picture of the bowls in that chapter with an aroma, which are the prayers of the saints. Sure. And w- later on in Revelation, we're going to see what are they praying about? And once again, they're praying for those who are persecuted. They're praying that uh, God's judgment and justice and redemption and rescue for those who are being per- persecuted, that's going to play out in, in, in the prayers as well. So when it can't be fulfilled, like Jeff is saying, and how much heartbreak is there? And there's a longing for, for the right to be done. John's on an island mm-hmm. in punishment for proclaiming the name of Jesus. Simply, Jesus is Lord, instead of saying Caesar is Lord. Mm-hmm. Like, God, are you going to do anything about this? Right. Like, and it's in those scrolls. And you know, we can't open them yet. Like, we can't even know what you're going to do or you can't do it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that would that would be that'd be crushing. And he's watching the other apostles be martyred. He's watching other believers be killed. So that that would be heartbreak. Like, is there any purpose behind this at all? Yeah. Last question. Okay. So, in addition to the apostle John's vision of Christ in the book of Revelation, John also saw Christ transfigured when Jesus walked the earth with with him. Yet John doesn't mention this event in the book of Revelation at all. Right. Do you have any speculation as to the reason it was left out? Yeah, I, I think you have to look at the purpose of the books. Look at the purpose of John, the the, the gospel of John. It's very different than the than the Revelation. Uh, the Revelation is doesn't include pre resurrection. It is resurrection forward. It is the church that is being persecuted and will continue to be persecuted. It is the return of Christ. 
it is what the church needs to be aware of and be looking for. Whereas the gospel of John is very different. It's understanding the love of Jesus and, you know, the teachings of Jesus and it, its purpose within the church was very different than the purpose of revelation within the church. So I think if, as long as you can clarify both, uh, it, you get a better understanding of, of what he's trying to do. I guess I can view revelation. John's kind of a scribe and he's, mm-hmm. he's seeing this, he's writing down what he's seeing, right? That's so he's not point. really thinking, this is how I want to portray this. Or here's how we're, we're in the gospel. You, you've got an opportunity where he's reliving, he's telling his, his life, you know, his yeah. experience is like with, with, with Jesus. But I think in this case, he's just, he's just writing down what, what God told him to write down. So mm-hmm. why it wasn't included? Cause God didn't tell him to write, write down in there. Yeah. So he just didn't include it. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for answering all these questions and joining us for this week's episode of The Follow-Up. And we will see you guys in the next one. Make sure you are subscribed so you never miss out on an episode. And we will see you guys next week for Revelation chapter six.